Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Let's see how this sounds real quick, Ed. Okay, testing, testing one, two. Testing one, two. Check, check, one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. It's not bad, okay. I'm gonna kill this. Okay, whoop, this is a hot mic. Check one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Sounds good. Is it clean or? No. Oh. So it's it's gated. Um, do we do we want to? Yeah. You want to just like wrap it on the stand there? Okay. All right, I'm monitoring the audio at the uh, podium, looking out over the audience, and uh, sounds pretty clean to me. Uh, yeah, mine was good, at least for your voice. So, no, no, this is just the house feed right now. All right. All right. A little bit. That's pretty good.
They're both set at 32 right now. I just put that one on preset just to see. So if you're going to balance them, take it off. Uh, all right. Here's that. Okay. And looking out at the audience, testing for the web sync. Test, test, test. Looking out over the audience. And hopefully it's a clean feed. Um, I know ours will be. Theirs sounded pretty good too. So talking, looking out over at the audience. You got it? No, he hasn't yet. Okay. All right. Still looking at the chairs, looking out over at the audience. Got it? Cool. I'm going to shut our mic off. Oh, well, I wonder if we can separate that. Oh, I'll pot it down at the camera, yeah. Yeah, the camera, no, it gets mixed in the recording. Right, yep. So ours was clean? What? Our mic was clean? Yeah. Okay.
I just feel like yours is a little more blue, even though it's only one off. 35? Okay, let me go look.
Good afternoon and, and welcome to the 26th annual, annual um, Academic Freedom Lecture honoring Davis, Markert, and Nickerson. My name is Bill Schultz. I'm a professor of mechanical engineering and naval architecture and marine engineering and chair of the Faculty Senate. On behalf of the Senate, I welcome distinguished guests, Professor Rodenberg, um, Provost Blair, the board of AFLF, many members and former members of the Senate, their guests, staff, and students. I especially want to welcome and introduce Peggy Hollingsworth, the president of AFLF. Peggy, along with her husband, Tad Smith, to whom this lecture is dedicated, co-founded this lecture and have been its lifeblood for the last 26 years. They both have held my position many moons ago. Please help me in welcoming Peggy. University of Michigan Senate's Davis Market Nickerson Lecture on Academic and Intellectual Freedom. You will notice from your program that the lecture this year is dedicated to my husband of 37 years and friends for much longer, Professor Charles B. Smith, also known to many of you as Tad. Tad supported the establishment of the lecture series through his work with the University of Michigan chapter of the American Association of University Professors. He was instrumental in founding the Academic Freedom Lecture Fund and had a quiet hand in essentially every aspect of his operations from the beginning. In fact, we were discussing the website of the Academic Freedom Lecture Fund at the time of his death. Professor Davis is one of the three former faculty members <clears throat> after whom this lecture series is named, but is enabled to be with us today for the first time since the inception of the Davis Market Nickerson Lecture. His wife, Natalie, recently had surgery and has not recovered to the point where Chandler felt comfortable leaving her for several days. He did, however, send a message which I would like to share with you. Peggy, you know how grateful and admiring I am for the patient and well-conceived work that has gone into this series over the years. From you and Tad and from Peter and all your team. But let me repeat it anyway. It's foul bad luck that my first lapse in attending the lectures comes just a wee mourning the loss of Tad's cheerful and constructive presence in all stages of the work. My sympathy and support all around." End quote. The Academic Freedom Lecture Fund and the University of Michigan lost a most dedicated and unwavering supporter <clears throat> with his passing. May we have a moment of silence in his memory. Thank you. <clears throat> the Senate Assembly's Davis Market Nickerson Lecturer Selection Committee was extremely pleased when Mark Rottenberg, President and CEO of the Electronic Privacy Information Center, accepted our invitation to deliver the 2016 Davis Market Nickerson Lecture. His lecture today covers a topic that is not only timely, but of universal importance. We are looking forward to your presentation. There are many who have made this lecture possible, individually and collectively. Please accept my deep and personal appreciation for all that you have done to make this lecture series as nearly as, nearly as I would be able to determine the longest continuous series of lectures on academic and intellectual freedom at any institution of higher education in the United States. Provost and Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs, Martha Pollack, is listed in your program to introduce our speaker. Unfortunately, she is ill. Sarah Blair, Vice Provost for Academic and Faculty Affairs, will introduce this year's University of Michigan Senate's Davis Marco Nickerson Lecture on Academic and Intellectual Freedom. Provost Blair.
Thank you, Peggy. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm honored to be here on behalf of Provost Pollock and to join you and everyone assembled today for the Davis Markert Nickerson Academic and Intellectual Freedom Lecture. Since the first lecture in 1991, the Academic Freedom Lecture, as it's commonly known, has become an important event on campus, one faculty, students, and many others look forward to each year. Over the years, a distinguished group of scholars, jurists, and journalists have delivered lectures that have explored changes in society, including new technology, that raise challenges for academic freedom, have examined the tension between national security and the public's right to know, and have offered judicial perspective on questions related to academic freedom. Each year, our community appreciates the special opportunity to learn that these lectures provide. Some of us here today can recall the McCarthy era of the 1950s, but most people in our community, and indeed our country, are too young to recall those years. At that time in our history, a climate of fear was pervasive. Limits were imposed on freedom of thought, speech, political activity, and association. No matter what their social station, individuals were afraid to speak out or to protest. If they did so, they might be branded communists or sympathizers, and they faced serious, to say the least, consequences. In 1954, the United States House of Representatives Un-American Activities Committee sent a delegation to several states, including Michigan, to collect testimony about possible subversive activity. Professors Chandler Davis, Clement Markert, and Mark Nickerson were called to testify. They refused to do so. As a result, the university suspended all of them. Dr. Davis was dismissed from the university and also charged with contempt of Congress. He was indicted and then, in 1957, convicted on the contempt charge. After an unsuccessful appeal, he was sentenced to time in federal prison. Leaving prison, Dr. Davis joined the faculty of the University of Toronto, where he had a long and notable career as a mathematician. Dr. Markert, a biologist, was ultimately reinstated in his position in biology here. Nevertheless, he left Michigan to chair the Department of Biology at Yale. Elected to the National Academy of Sciences, he finished his career as Distinguished University Research Professor at North Carolina State University. Dr. Nickerson was dismissed from the university despite having achieved tenure here. A pharmacologist, he took a faculty position at McGill University, where he led his department, authored more than 250 publications, and later served as president of the Pharmacological Society of Canada. Each of these scholars made significant contributions to their fields of expertise. Each of them also took a stand, protecting the rights of freedom of thought, of speech, and of political activity that are important to all of us as academics and as citizens. It's good that we come together each year to salute Professors Davis, Markert, and Nich Nickerson, and to affirm our own commitment to these fundamental principles. Our Senate Assembly affirmed them when it adopted a statement on academic freedom in 2010. This statement addresses such concerns as the freedom to pursue research, publish and teach, to criticize university policies, and to engage in public debate. With this statement, the faculty recognized the importance of articulating these principles even when there is not an imminent threat to such freedoms. Today, we are honored to have Mark Rotenberg on campus as the 2016 Davis Markert Nickerson Lecturer. He is the CEO and President of the Electronic Privacy Information Center, known as EPIC, and a member of the Faculty of Law at Georgetown University. An expert on information privacy and open government, Professor Rotenberg is deeply engaged in the development and the critique of public policies in this area. His work addresses issues of critical importance to all of us, the benefits and costs of new technologies, the collection and use of personal data, identity theft. He's testified before the United States Congress more than 60 times, written more than 50 amicus briefs on privacy and civil liberties, and submitted comments in about 1,000 federal agency rulemaking and other agency proceedings. This last category, rulemaking, is often the place where the real action of policymaking takes place. Professor Rotenberg's attention to it is a mark of his deep dedication to privacy concerns. 
Professor Ruttenberg has also served as an advisor to numerous organizations, including the American Association for the Advancement of Science, UNESCO, the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, and the International Telecommunications Union. He has spoken to the European Parliament several times and has addressed issues of security and liberty before the 9-11 Commission in this country. The issues Professor Rotenberg works on are important and complex. His deeply principled mix of scholarship and activism has made a difference in privacy policies and in public understanding of this critical area. It also makes him a wonderfully appropriate speaker today as we honor Professors Davis, Markert, and Nickerson for their principled stand on privacy. Please join me in welcoming Professor Rodenberg. Thank you so much for that very kind introduction. It really is an honor for me to be here today to speak with you. And I'd like to thank the university, the Academic Freedom Committee, and especially Peggy Hollingsworth for making this um, possible. I also wanted to say that the particular history of Professors Davis, Markert, and Nickerson is not unknown to me. I was interested in the 1950s and McCarthyism at a young age. I actually spent a fair amount of time reading the hearing transcripts. And it's sad, you know, to listen to people who were brought before congressional committees, asked to reveal private communications, friendships, and to do so at the cost of their own personal freedom. I think the fact that these professors chose not to go down that road and the university has subsequently honored them reveals a great and deep commitment to intellectual freedom. But I'm also pleased to say for people that don't have the time to go through hearing transcripts, there's a new wonderful movie out, I think it came out shortly after the lecture last year, the story of Dalton Trumbo, who was a very famous Hollywood uh, screenwriter during the 1950s and experienced the true force of HUAC on his personal life, his public life, his family, and his friends. There's one thing I can tell you that I took away from the movie. It's the sense that people at the time could not fully comprehend what the true scope of the danger was. They imagined that this was something that could simply be managed or might quickly go away. The opposite turned out to be true. I want to say a few words also as I get into my talk this evening about my own experience uh, with the First Amendment. You know, I'm sometimes in groups where people say, well, we understand that you think privacy is important, but of course the First Amendment is also important. And they set them up as if the two interests are opposed. Uh, my view has always been that privacy and freedom of expression are deeply intertwined, that you can't actually have true intellectual freedom without the ability to protect privacy. It's something my parents had taught me, and just a brief story, um, when I was in uh, high school, I was a, a leader of a, of a Jewish youth organization um, in New England, very large organization actually. Um, but I was also uh, concerned about free speech issues and I decided to take off the second year of my senior year in high school to go work for the ACLU. And this was in the late 1970s and there was quite a lot of controversy around a protest taking place in Skokie, Illinois that was being organized by the American Nazi Party. And I felt that it was important to defend that right of free speech even I was, as I was leading a, a Jewish youth organization in New England. Now, unfortunately, I didn't do quite such a good job with my own children, so now I'm gonna tell you a story and embarrass my son, who's a recent graduate of the M University of, of Michigan. Um, when he was in high school, I noticed something on his Facebook page, and uh, he had posted something that I thought was just really terribly inappropriate. I mean. He had used some words, which at least in those days, this was five or six years ago, you didn't often see in print. And I said, uh, <laughs> I, said I think you, you really need to take that down and, and um, you know, I, I think we need to talk about your allowance. I was kind of upset. Now, I was friends with him on Facebook and that had actually 
impress the other parents who had wondered how did I manage to get my kids to, to friend me. It, it, it wasn't easy. Uh, but I went to him and I said, you know, I'm, I'm not happy about this and I think you need to take it down. And uh, he said to me, well, some free speech advocate you turned out to be. <laughs> and then he defriended me. <laughs> so, so I learned my lesson. Even when you think you're a great uh, free speech advocate, it's not always the case. Well, I'm going to talk to you uh, today about what I think is mo one of the most critical issues in the realm of freedom of expression and the very important interplay between free speech and the right uh, to privacy. And the view that I'm going to present today, I will tell you at the outset, is not a very popular view. Um, it is in the minority among uh, legal experts, at least within the United States, and so I feel that I'm fully embracing a talk on intellectual freedom by giving you um, a controversial presentation. To get to the presentation, though, I need to tell you a little bit about my organization, the Electronic Privacy Information Center. We were established to focus on emerging privacy and civil liberties uh, issues. We started the same year that people, I guess, learned about the internet, 1994. The Mozilla web browser was pretty much year uh, zero for, for uh, internet uh, as, a, as a public uh, network. Um, we are obviously committed to privacy protection, which we believe is a fundamental right, and we have defended that right before the U.S. Congress and U.S. courts and federal agencies and elsewhere. But this is where it gets interesting. We are equally committed to freedom of expression, and we are equally committed to open government. In fact, the famous case, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with, ACLU versus Reno, could be properly captioned ACLU stroke epic versus Reno. I don't say that just as the CEO, but in fact, we were one of the parties in the case, and I was one of the attorneys in the case that established uh, very important principles to safeguard uh, internet freedom that has since made uh, internet publication uh, you know, so unrestricted. And even as I say those words, I'm beginning to have some second thoughts. But you get my point. Uh, we support freedom of expression. And we have supported open government because we believe that one of the best ways to protect the privacy of the citizen, the privacy of the individual, is to have a better understanding about how the government collects and uses information about people whether systems of surveillance are justified, whether expert systems produce expert outcomes, whether profiling is needed, how decisions are made about people at airports, entering federal office buildings, and even simply walking down the street. All of these questions are better understood if we have the ability through open government laws to understand how our government makes decisions about us. There is nothing incompatible between claims of privacy and claims of transparency. And a final point, which I'll get to later in my talk, is I also had a little something to do with the development of the internet and the creation of the .org domain. And I also have some opinions about the evolving architecture of the internet and how very important it is that we understand properly the right to be forgotten. That's our word cloud. It's colorful, isn't it? Epic.org, you'll find more there. We're gonna to talk tonight about a case decided by the European Court of Justice, 2014, that's been given the short name, the familiar name, the right to be forgotten. The case is actually captioned Google versus Spain. I've actually subsequently renamed it Spain versus Google, but I'll get to that in a moment. Google versus Spain involved three distinct actors. There was a Spanish citizen, Mr. Consteja, who had suffered a personal bankruptcy. And subject to a Spanish law, a newspaper in Spain published the fact of his bankruptcy and announced an auction 
for his personal items. Interestingly, Mr. Consteja paid off his debts and the auction never occurred. Many, many, many years later, the internet comes along, news organizations publish online, news organizations reach into their archives, scan their archives, put their stories online, and someone uncovers the fact that Mr. Consteja had suffered a personal bankruptcy. In fact, if you did a search for Mr. Consteja because you were a friend of his, because you were a possible employer of his, or business acquaintance, it was the very first thing that came up about him. The personal bankruptcy that had been reported in a newspaper, small newspaper, more than a decade earlier. That information became available on the internet because an internet search company was making information in digital formats widely available to people all around the world. So we have in this case, just at the outset and to clarify, Mr. Consteja, whose personal information has been made available on the internet. We have the Spanish news organization that had published the original story and subsequently made the story available on their website in a digital format. And we have the internet search company. Now, when the Spanish Data Protection Agency looked at this case, they concluded that there should be, oh, I'm sorry, I've left out a key part, because if you're Mr. Consteja, what do you do? In fact, what would you do if you found yourself in this situation? Mr. Consteja, went to the news organization, said this is very embarrassing, no longer relevant, please take this down. Went to Google, said this is very embarrassing, no longer relevant, please take this down. Neither responded as he had hoped. He went to the Spanish Data Protection Agency, a federal agency, much like our Federal Trade Commission or our Federal Communications Commission, and said I believe that I have a legal right to have my personal information, information about me, removed because it is no longer relevant. The Spanish Data Protection Agency took quite a bit of time as they considered Mr. Consteja's complaint. And they concluded, with respect to the news organization, yes, with respect to the news organization, Mr. Consteja privacy claim was less than the free expression claim. And they could not tell the news organization to remove the information that they had posted online. But with respect to the search company that was making personal information available online for commercial benefit, and this is of course through the process of advertising because you take the data and you put it on a website and you sell the presentation of those facts to advertisers based on the content of the facts and the identity of the user, they were at least subject to privacy law and under some circumstances could be required to delist the information from the website. The European Court of Justice, in an opinion we're going to look at a little bit more closely, essentially reaches the same conclusion. Distinguishing between the three parties, the individual, the news organization, and the search engine. And the court concludes that the burden is ultimately on the search company to decide how best to apportion the privacy interests and the data that it makes available. Now there was a lot of criticism of this opinion, not surprisingly from the search company, but also from many others who said, well this is an assault on freedom of expression, this is an assault on the press. If this European approach 
to the internet takes hold in the United States, we will lose our First Amendment freedoms. You'll find lots and lots of those articles if you search for them, if they haven't been delisted, if you search for them after this opinion was issued. I believe they fundamentally misunderstood not only what the case was about, but also what the significance of this case is for the future of free expression in the online world. It wasn't the famous people who were seeking to have their past transgressions removed from the internet. In 98% of the cases, as the data revealed, it was actually private individuals asking that private facts be taken down from the internet. And my radical proposition, which I will get to a little further on, the case is good not only for privacy and not only for freedom of expression, but also for the evolving architecture of the internet. Now, here are the details, and I've provided to the to them to you already in the overview of the case. And as you can see, it is simply about the personal bankruptcy that he had previously suffered. The, ca the case is captioned Google versus Spain because Google appealed from the judgment of the Spanish Data Protection Agency. And as lawyers, we would properly describe the case by putting the name of the appellant first. As I've talked more and more about the case, I've come to the view that it might better be understood as Spain versus Google. Because what you see, in fact, is the assertion of a fundamental right, the right to privacy, as against a commercial service. Now, where does this right derive? It derives in part from a provision of the Data Protection Directive adopted by the European Union in 1995 with the goal of harmonizing privacy laws across the European Union. And you'll see here in 12b it says something about appropriate rectification, erasure, or blocking of data. And people will look at that and say, my, that sounds you know, sort of odd. It's kind of almost anti-scientific that we would remove actual facts from the public record. Now, I'm going to argue tonight that, in fact, that's very much a part of the American tradition. 25 years before Europe adopted its comprehensive privacy law, the US adopted one of the first modern privacy laws called the Fair Credit Reporting Act. And guess what legal right the Fair Credit Reporting Act establishes? It establishes the right for an individual to say as to inaccurate information why that information is not correct and to prevent that inaccurate information from being subsequently disclosed to third parties. Because we understand in the realm of commerce that to say about someone that they have you know, wrongfully suffered a bankruptcy can have an actual impact on their business life. It's called defamation. Now as to the judgment, a few key points to understand. To be certain, the European Court was concerned about the public's right to know. If, for example, Mr. Consteja was running for public office, perhaps being considered to be Minister of Finance in Spain, then we might well say that the fact of his personal bankruptcy bears on the question as to whether he's competent to hold that office. But in the absence of that connection to some actual public consideration, then it's not at all clear what its significance might be. And it was even in the famous Brandeis Warren article where Judge, actually before he became Justice Brandeis, when Louis Brandeis, a practicing attorney in Boston, set out the right to privacy, he said the first competing interest was the public's right to know relevant facts about an individual. But he cautioned, he said, we must distinguish 
between public figures, people who run for public office, where private facts might be relevant for how we understand them, and private individuals, those in whom we're not asked to place our trust, whose private life really should not be subject to that degree of scrutiny. Now this is where it gets interesting. And this is where you begin to get a sense of the significance of this case for the evolving architecture of the internet. The Court of Justice of the European Union, which has legal authority over all of the EU member states, rules that European Union citizens do have this right to go to a search engine and have the link to the negative story in some circumstances removed. What's the scope of that right? Let's say you're a citizen in France and you go to the search company and you say to the search company, this information about me is no longer relevant, it's embarrassing, it should be removed, see the decision of the European Court of Justice. And the search company says, okay, we'll agree to do that. We'll agree to do that in the .fr domain because you're a French citizen. We respect the legal system of France. We're operating in France. And the scope of our obligation is simply to other people within that legal system, right? And if you ask us to do any more than that, now the French government is trying to censor the internet. They're just as bad as Russia, or China, or anybody else who's trying to prevent public criticism from being aired on the internet. And the reaction from the French Data Protection Agency seeking to enforce the right of the individual is that makes no sense at all. The harm from the publication of private facts occurs whether it's regard to the publication in France, in Germany, the US, or anywhere else. And by the way, you're operating search engines in all those companies and countries. So if you have an obligation to remove the link in .fr, you must certainly have the obligation to remove the link in all the other jurisdictions in which people can get access to the information. Well, I jumped into this um, debate and I was taken by this argument. Um, obviously, I have a privacy bias. I won't deny that. But I also have a bias toward logic. And if I substitute bank details for harmful private information, the problem with the search engine's position becomes immediately apparent, right? If you are a US consumer and someone has published on an internet website your credit card details, the number, the expiration date, and the security code, and you go to the search company and you say, you are publishing all over the internet the data that would make it possible for someone to commit financial theft. And the search company said, oh, we're very sorry about that. Terrible mistake on our part. We will be sure to remove it from the .us domain. Does that work for you? Does that make any sense? If the harm exists in the publication of the information, it must necessarily exist if the publication occurs in other jurisdictions. And so far, it must necessarily be the case that the information needs to be delinked in all of the jurisdictions. Now, I'm going to push the US argument just a little bit more. Because as, as I said at the outset, there's a tendency here to say, well, this is about privacy versus freedom of expression. As I said, the Spanish news organization was left alone. There's a tendency sometimes to talk about trade-offs or balancing. I'm just 
kind of genetically opposed to that view of the world. I think we should live in a world of privacy and freedom of expression and open government, and we need more of all, right? So when someone says, well, we need to balance, I think sometimes we're not fully understanding how the interests align. In the US, for example, we have very elaborate expungement laws. We have laws for juvenile criminal offenders. We have laws for rape victims. We have laws for bankruptcy all with the goal of trying to protect the individual, enable the individual to meaningfully participate in public life by prohibiting the disclosure of certain private facts. And this, of course, was the point that I also was making a moment ago about the Brandeis, dissent, about the Brandeis opinion in the, in the Right to Privacy article, to protect private life as against those types of intrusions. I have here a citation um, talking about the significance of expungement to protect the interests of individuals. There's a very interesting uh, effort underway right now across the United States called Ban the Box. Is anyone familiar with Ban the Box? These are about employment applications. And the question that the boss, box typically asks is, have you ever been arrested? Well, arrest only is a very interesting determination, or more precisely, a non-determination in the criminal justice system. There's no disposition as to guilt or innocence. There's simply the fact that at a moment in time, someone was arrested by a police officer. Not surprisingly, that determination falls disproportionately against certain communities in the United States. And if you are concerned about the ability of people to meaningfully participate in the employment process without being immediately excluded by systems, by the way, that are increasingly automated and simply scan to see who has been previously arrested and immediately exclude them from the job pool, then you begin to understand the very powerful impact that the disclosure of these private facts can have on a person's life. I was interested a few years ago when I saw that um, California had passed a new law that was nicknamed the Eraser Law. What does the Eraser Law do? It gives individuals, minors, or the parents of minors, the right to require that internet companies, not just search companies, but internet companies broadly, remove personal information when the individual um, is no longer using the service. I mean, maybe you say, you know, I've had enough, I want to, you know, stop using uh, Facebook, for example, I'll, you know, cancel my service, I want my data deleted, right? It's kind of like when you close a bank account, you want your money back, right? The bank doesn't say, well, goodbye, Right? We'll keep your money, you're gone. Similar principle with regard to data and internet services. Now some people will say, well, that doesn't really make much sense because of course you've posted something on Facebook or your child has and maybe someone else downloaded it or maybe that information is somewhere else available and all that may be true. But that still doesn't answer the question whether it should be the case that people have the right as users of a service that's taking their personal information to be able to say to the service, I'm no longer using the service, you should appropriately delete the information, it's not yours, it's mine, right? That's the California eraser law. It looks very much like a right to be forgotten. Again on this point, I was really interested after the decision came out on American attitudes toward the right to be forgotten. People said, well, big First Amendment tradition, you know, privacy laws in Europe, seems sort of un-American to have a right to be forgotten. But from at least one survey, there was strong uh, evidence for the proposition that people recognize that personal data, private data on the internet can be damaging or misleading. And there was also support for the proposition that people should have the right to have uh, information removed, although significantly the question as to what constitutes relevance is a hard question. 
we were having the conversation earlier, I suggested that if the European court had used the distinction between a public person and a private person, we would pretty quickly understand what relevance means, but they chose instead to use that formulation. From this survey, 61% of Americans believe some version of the right to be forgotten is necessary, 39% want a blanket right, nearly half of respondents concerned that irrelevant search results can harm a person's uh, reputation. Um, I should probably make some joking reference to the 2016 presidential election, wondering if that can actually ever be true, but I'll save that. So um, let me also raise for you a uh, related issue, which um, a very uh, good professor, friend of mine, Daniel uh, Citrone at the University of Maryland School of Law has, has written a fantastic uh, book about, uh, about um, a, a, um, you know, cyber assault and the internet. And this is the problem of revenge porn. Well, people who aren't familiar with this term, let me try to explain it to you. You've got a lot of young people nowadays with cell phones, and you've got a lot of people taking uh, pictures of themselves uh, to try to impress their boyfriends or girlfriends. Not a wise idea, uh, just speaking as a parent, but it's happening, okay? It's a reality, and I'm sure schools here and elsewhere are dealing with that issue. But here's an interesting question. What happens when someone in possession of one of these photos chooses to publish it for the purpose of harming or embarrassing the person who's in the photo, right? I mean, maybe it wasn't such a good breakup. Maybe someone's pretty angry. And maybe they feel they have the right to embarrass the person that they were with by publishing this very private thing that was shared with them. Would we think of that as a free expression, right? Would we even think of it as a right to access information? I think both of those claims as legal constructs are very thin. In fact, if we take a step back and we ask the question, where is the free expression interest in the revenge porn scenario? I think the free expression interest is the, to the person who chose to reveal themselves in a certain way at a certain moment in time. That's where the expressive act occurred. And if that's the interest we're trying to protect, then I think we should be very careful about what happens when that image is in the hands of others. Interestingly, this example, like the credit card number example, is one that Google doesn't dispute, right? So we talked about the obvious risk with bank details being made publicly available and that the logical outcome is to remove the link from across all domains. But if you think about revenge porn for a moment, and now we're not in the economic harm realm, we're in some other realm, the logical outcome is almost certainly the removal of that image across all domains. Another issue that I'm fascinated by where I think privacy and freedom of expression align concerns the notion of algorithmic transparency. Increasingly, these decisions that are being made about us are automated and opaque. They're based on rules that typically, as the subjects, we don't have access to, based on criteria that we don't see. And some of the outcomes can be very troubling. If you're in the criminal justice field, for example, you know, you know that race correlates positively with recidivism. And if you were making a determination as to sentencing on a purely rational basis, racial considerations would produce different outcomes. 
In fact, if a parent is incarcerated, that correlates also posi positively with recidivism. So now you may find yourself making decisions about a particular individual standing in your courtroom based not necessarily on the act that he or she committed, but on factors beyond their control. I want you to think about this issue and the interplay between transparency and privacy and whether in fact this is another example of the need to establish a right to be forgotten, a need to establish a legal rule where pure scientific fact might produce a different outcome that's made all the more important because more and more of these decisions are not transparent. Well, this was my Brandeis argument. The part of the story that I left out when I told you about Brandeis and the famous right to privacy article was that he not only set the cornerstone for privacy in modern America, he was also one of the architects of our modern First Amendment. It was actually Justice Brandeis who on the court writing the dissents in the World War I protest cases and his ability to persuade Justice Holmes that led to a much more robust understanding about the true scope of First Amendment freedoms. And there was nothing in the Brandeis opinions, in my opinion, that undercut his earlier claims of privacy. But if you want a competing view, and as I said at the very beginning, I'm giving you a controversial view tonight. This is not the majority opinion in the US Legal Academy. Uh, Neil Richards, uh, professor uh, at the Washington School of Law, has an excellent book called Intellectual Privacy. He argues that Justice Brandeis's views evolved. He thought privacy was important in the 1890 article and maybe a little less so by the time he did the World War I dissents. Uh, Jeffrey Rosen has just written a new biography of Brandeis and incorporates some of Neil's views. And I would encourage you, uh, in the spirit of intellectual freedom, uh, the event this evening and the people that we're honoring to take a look at their arguments as well. But it is my view that privacy and freedom of expression properly understood, as I believe Justice Brandeis understood them, is that they are compatible interests. I said at the outset, it is a significant case. It favors the news organization. It distinguishes the news organization from the commercial search provider. And it puts the responsibility for delisting where it should be on the commercial search company. And if I were a First Amendment lawyer, I would, I would cite this case in support of my client. I would say that this case stands for the proposition that as great as a privacy concern may be, at least with regard to the issue of the delisting, it's not the news organization you go to, it's the search company. Now I'm going to make one final point and then happy to stop and, and take your questions. As I said at the beginning, my interest in this particular topic is not only about the relationship between privacy and freedom of expression which I believe are enormously important to understand, particularly as they apply to legal claims on the internet. But even about the evolution of the internet itself, when I worked on the Communications Decency Act in the 1990s, the internet really was a distributed web. It was described in one of the lower court opinions that led up to ACLU versus Reno as a network of electronic newsstands, bookstores, and libraries. And that was the description upon which we relied when we made the argument to the court that there should be as little restriction as possible, that it should be almost a print plus above the First Amendment protections traditionally offered to print media 
something closer to what we might think of as a distributor liability. For example, a bookstore has even greater free expression uh, protection than does a newspaper, because the bookstore can't be responsible for each of the words in each of the books that it makes available to the public. And we were making an argument very much like this. But here's the interesting thing. The architecture of the internet has changed in very dramatic ways over the last 20 years. We did not conceive 20 years ago that there would be effectively one portal to find information on the internet. We thought people would be going to all the news sites directly, all the bookstores and all the newsstands directly, and that this would be a flourishing ecosystem for online publication. But as you know, something very different has happened. Many of the news organizations in the United States have shuttered. It's very difficult today to get a job in journalism. Some of the large news organizations are doing quite well. But for regional newspapers and local newspapers, the story is very different. And I think part of the problem may be that the liability has actually been placed at the wrong location. The liability should not be at the endpoints where the actual news organizations exist. The liability should be in the middle on those who are benefiting through the commercial use and direction to the actual news organizations. Now, to be clear on this point, search is enormously important, and I don't mean to suggest otherwise. But I'm trying to make an argument today that if we are thinking about the future of information online, it is the robust accessibility of many distributed voices in many locations that's actually vital to the future of freedom of expression. And if we end up in a world where all information is acquired through only one portal, I do not think that's a world in which free expression will prosper. And for that reason, as well as the defense of privacy and freedom of expression, I think it's vitally important to understand the right to be forgotten. A few other final points. How we understand this relationship is also in the realm of identification. It's also in the realm of the secret ballot. Can you actively participate in a democracy if your vote will be known by others? It's also in the protection of journalistic sources. All around us, if we look closely, we see that privacy and freedom of expression work together for the purpose of safeguarding the fundamental rights of citizens in a constitutional democracy. And so tonight we are honoring three people who during, during a very difficult time, during a time where there was enormous political and personal stake in the decisions that people made, chose to make the right decision. It was not an easy decision. And I think we honor them when we continue to do that, stand behind the right decision and safeguard intellectual freedom. So thank you very much. Are there any questions? Mark, thank you for being here. That's my here. book, by the way. Thank you for being here um, and giving such a, such a great presentation. So here's my question. Mr. Costeja, in some ways, is an easy case, right? Because he's a relatively obscure person, private individual. The bankruptcy is 10 years old. And so at the time the information is, del is deleted, there's no particular public interest in knowing this about him. It, it, he's sort of the easy case where you can argue there's nothing relevant. There may be some irony in it that some people have observed that after this, he's not only not forgotten, he becomes the most famous deadbeat in the world. But, um, but at least at the time the decision is made, the rationale is that he's a private individual. Let me give you what I think is a harder case. Let's assume that there's a private individual who has some bankruptcies 
and asks for them to delete, be deleted at the time he's a private individual. And let's assume that after the bankruptcies, he goes on to become a billionaire and just hypothetically run for the presidency of the United States. This is very speculative. Entirely speculative on okay. my part. And let's assume that the news agencies are interested in the question of whether this person who's running on the platform of his business success has ever had to declare bankruptcy. And so they go looking for exactly that information that they now think is in the public interest. And now it's harder for them to find it. It may still be out there, but if this is a person who does business in lots of different states, those inf that information and those records are spread around in a way that isn't centralized in the way that it is when you can search it through Google. So my question for you is, while it may be true that at the time you make the decision, you can make an assessment about whether it's relevant as of that time, how do you deal with the problem of whether it becomes relevant later? Is there any um, room in the doctrine to recapture the information or to reinstate it? Or do we just live with the consequences of making the decision based on the information at the time we have it? All right. we make it? So it's an excellent question. There's not a simple answer. And my experience in talking uh, about this subject is that people who have a background in law know that sometimes there are relevant facts that we exclude. And people who have a background in science are just uncomfortable with that. I, I think it's a, it's a cultural thing. Um, but in law, of course, you know, there may be hearsay evidence. I mean, people may say stuff and like, boy, we'd sure like to get that into the trial. But for lots of reasons, we know that hearsay is not relevant, so we exclude it. Now, those types of rules about how we exclude true facts are not simply applied. And if you say, as you did you know, earlier today, I think quite rightly, gee, relevance. I mean, what's relevant in one context may not be relevant in another context. That's absolutely true. I do think it's important as we think, and again with a nod to the scientists, about the outcome in the um, uh, European court decision. No information was ever destroyed, right? The Company, the court never said to the Spanish newspaper, all traces of these facts should be removed. And then, of course, if they had done that, you would come back to me and say, well, now this fellow's been nominated for finance minister in Spain, and no one's going to know the fact you know, that, that this had occurred in the past. And I think we would both be troubled. I mean, it begins to get a little Orwellian at that moment. But I do think in lots and lots of ways, we have techniques where we manage the allocation of personal information. I'm even thinking about simple things like, you know, university transcripts. You know, we disclose university transcripts in particular contexts for a particular purpose. Oftentimes we hope with the agreement of the student for the purpose of advancing some interest that the student has because she's applying to graduate school or a job or something and not just willy-nilly because you know, someone's interested to see some students' grades, yes? So there are ways to manage um, these determinations. I don't think they're always going to be simple. I do think it's significant that Google actually did find that it could manage the request, that most of the requests, the vast majority of the requests, were actually quite reasonable. Yes, there were some instances where you had public officials you know, very embarrassed about doing something which they most certainly shouldn't have done. And, try to get that removed from uh, the search company and you know Google said no and they got all upset and that's probably the right outcome. Um, but that's my answer I think. I think it's a hard problem but I think it's a problem that can be addressed. So. Um, hi, uh, thanks for coming. Oh. Um, I thought you might be interested in uh, research by Sonia Starr who's a professor here suggesting, I think it's preliminary but uh, suggested that the um, ban the box uh, laws might have a perverse uh, impact in that uh, employers without the information tend to, uh, tend to uh, think that um, uh, applicants from minority, um, uh, of, of minority groups tend to sort of assume that they might have criminal backgrounds and therefore uh, don't hire them. Um, and so that the, uh, the ones who are uh, hurt are the ones from minority backgrounds without, uh, uh, without, those, uh, with, with, without a criminal history. 
So I, th I think it's I think it's preliminary research, but uh, it's it's yeah, well, just, uh, it might might I've, do I've, back, work. I mean, backwards. it's possible. I've I've got more evidence on my side. Um, I was interested. A law that was passed in Massachusetts recently limits the ability of employers to ask prospective employees about past salary history. Now, this is interesting. Why are they doing this? Because women earn 77 cents on the dollar for the exact same job that a man takes. And if you ask about post pre-salary history, you're actually perpetuating this gender bias that currently exists in uh, hiring. Now, I'm not saying that that's not without its own faults as well, or that in some circumstances it wouldn't be useful to have access to that information. I'm just trying to suggest that in the world of, you know, fairness and opportunity, we actually should wrestle with the issue of which facts are relevant and appropriate when we make decisions about people because those decisions about people and the factors that we take into account have real consequences. I mean, the fact that Mr. Constecha was known as a deadbeat by anyone who looked for him on the internet must have had consequences. So, yes, sir. Uh, Florian Schaub from the School of Information. Uh, thanks for the really interesting talk. I was wondering, um, you, you mentioned this problem that the internet was designed as a distributed system, right? Um, and now we kind of have these big search engines which have the, the indices to the not so distributed network anymore. And the question is, uh, now if we have a right to be forgotten, all of a sudden Google becomes this arbitrator of what is relevant. And maybe, maybe that works and they make reasonable decisions, but we also have other cases where Facebook, for example, removes images and posts they deem unacceptable or immoral. Um, the same for Apple, that is very restrictive in terms of what kind of software they let in their stores. So how do we balance these um, different competing forces? In right. A way? So I'm glad you asked the question. One of the criticisms I've heard of the uh, Court of Justice opinion is that it places uh, too much power uh, in the hands of Google. Right? Because now Google is making determinations about which information should be online and which information should be dis delisted. And they say, well, isn't you know, that a problem as well? Part of my argument here is that I think if you think of the company as engaging in a commercial service, then this is nothing more than regulatory compliance. In other words, if you choose to you know, manufacture a product or sell a vehicle, you have certain obligations to comply with the laws. Not every decision you make should be subject to a court review. And if someone feels that your decision wasn't adequate or correct, then that person still has the right to go and challenge your determination, which happens, by the way. In these uh, delisting cases, if people are not satisfied with the outcome, they can go back and seek you know, legal redress, and maybe Google is right, maybe not. But those decisions operate, you see, within a legal framework. Um, and of course, the, the fact that one company is making so many of these decisions does, I think, buttress my argument about the evolving architecture of the internet and the concern that I have that it has become too concentrated. I would much prefer that there were many, many more companies operating in the search space, um, you know, dealing with these issues. And I apologize, by the way, I know giving the talk it sounds a little bit, you know, anti-Google, but you see it's actually any company in that role, you know, would create the same type of issues. So in, in fact, it's quite generic, I would say, this view. So yes, please. I'm curious about the decision-making algorithms that you referred to where a par parent's incarceration or your race gets factored in. You're taking correlations and ascribing causation to them and with no transparency. How do citizens get that remediated? What do we have to do to make sure that causation is really being yeah algorithmically interpreted rather than correlation? All right, well, it's, it's exactly the right question. I can give you a, a brief answer, a project that um, Epic has recently taken on 
under the banner of algorithmic transparency. There is a, um, I won't, I don't remember the company actually, but you can find it on our website. There is a company uh, that works with many of the prosecutor's offices in the United States to uh, analyze DNA trace samples. It's a forensic uh, technique. So you, you have a crime that's occurred and you gather some DNA trace evidence and then the company uh, looks at the sample and with some probability is able to say that is 99.8% likely uh, a match with John Williams, right? Very powerful evidence, by the way, if you have that kind of evidence before a jury. We were interested in the question as to whether or not that technique was transparent, right? In other words, could a defense attorney or someone else say, how did you get 99.8? I mean, what's your, what, you know, what, what's the chemical analysis and what's the identification analysis? Um, how do we know it's actually 99.8 or not 99.2? And the company said, well, you have to understand this is a proprietary technique and if we make this publicly available then we lose you know, our business model. And I respect that by the way. I mean I think there are really oftentimes competing interests here. But I think that proprietary interest in protecting the technique actually has to give way to the fairness of the guilt or innocence determination. So we pursued Freedom of Information Act cases in half a dozen states in the U.S. and we're beginning to get some information about the use of this particular technique because we think it's vitally important to know if it's reliable. And if you're interested in this field, I'll say this because, I mean, this is my life. I'm fascinated by it. There was a long period of time um, in the United States where people believed, you know, that um, a polygraph, you know, was scientific magic. I mean, you could ask anybody anything under any circumstance and get a truthful uh, answer. And the, and the history of the polygraph is really quite remarkable. I mean, in fairness, you know, law enforcement was trying to find more scientific methods to incorporate in the investigations that they were pursuing. You know, and the polygraph was, you know, needles and paper and the whole thing looked, you know, very modern. Uh, and people are, you know, being convicted uh, based on techniques that were later shown to be you know, not reliable. So this is another way in which it plays out. Yes? Yeah. Well, uh, Juan Cole, the uh, History Department. Uh, thanks so much for this very thought-provoking uh, talk. I wanted to uh, raise the issue of uh, what I think of now as a phenomenon of indiscriminate whistleblowing. Uh, WikiLeaks uh, has uh, uh, not only released uh, Chelsea Manning's uh, yeah. State Department cables, but recently has done things like do a, a, a batch dump from a Turkish uh, government website that spread people's credit card uh, information and uh, uh, private addresses and things all across the internet. I mean, 50,000 Turkish women uh, were, uh, were affected by this. Uh, I think they didn't even know what was exactly in that batch dump. Uh, but in, in what, and I don't think we've seen the end of this kind of thing. So, uh, in, in a world in which uh, private information is is often confused with public information, and uh, and, and there is this kind of indiscriminate whistleblowing, uh, in what way uh, would would that be affected by uh, the right to privacy uh, law, and in, in in what way could you distinguish between? Yeah. Uh, the, the public and the private uh, uh, purposes here. That, that's a really good question. It actually uh, impacted our organization uh, directly. Uh, we had a conversation not too many years ago uh, with Glenn Greenwald and he was um, explaining uh, the justification for the WikiLeaks approach which he described as radical transparency and we said we showed, we thought it showed just incredible disregard of privacy interests of individuals, even though we're very much in favor of transparency. Um, we were even involved uh, a few years ago. We pursued a Freedom of Information Act request on behalf of WikiLeaks supporters because we were concerned that um, people who were supporting WikiLeaks were subject to additional scrutiny by the U.S. Treasury Department. We didn't necessarily agree with the positions that WikiLeaks was taking, but if you understand the First Amendment, you understand that one of the first rules that you oftentimes defend people who you don't necessarily agree with. And we did that with WikiLeaks, regardless of 
what they were saying or doing, uh, we did not believe that the government had a right to subject to additional scrutiny their, their supporters. Um, it's interesting, of course, because you know we were involved not only with the WikiLeaks thing, but also with the Snowden um, disclosure. I, I shouldn't say we were involved with the Snowden disclosure. That's not quite correct. <laughs> However, you know, he was much more careful. I mean, I think he actually learned from Assange what not to do. Um, he was more selective, and frankly, he disclosed the documents to journalists and said to the journalists, you will need to decide which documents you think are uh, appropriate, because I'm not the right person to make that decision. People don't actually know that uh, about Snowden, but it's an important fact, however you view uh, what he did. He, I think, was trying uh, to do a responsible type of whistleblowing. Now, here's the other part of the Snowden story where we were involved. Um, his very first disclosure was of a court order from the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. And it was signed uh, by Judge Vincent, and it authorized um, the disclosure, actually compelled the disclosure from Verizon of all of the customer detail records for domestic communications uh, for 90-day periods. And it was constantly renewed, as you may know. And um, I've been teaching privacy law for a long time. I've got a case, I've got a couple of case books actually on privacy law. Um, and I saw this order appear online. This was um, June 5th, 2013, I think, in The Guardian, if I've got the, the year right. Um, and I looked at it and I said, this has got to be like a parody. You know, all telephone records, 90-day period, domestic communications. I'm like reading The Onion or, you know, this is one of my colleagues, write an unlawful surveillance order. It was attached to an exam somewhere. But in fact, it was, it was the actual order. It was the actual order. And I know a bit about the FISA, and I know a bit about the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Corps, and I said, this, this cannot be. So Epic actually filed a petition, a mandamus petition, to the US Supreme Court. You'll find it online if it hasn't been delisted. Uh, in Ray Epic, relying on the first Snowden disclosure, arguing that the uh, disclosure, that the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court exceeded its authorization. And we also argued, why were we before the Supreme Court? Because it was the only court in our view that had the authority to review a decision of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. Um, and we went a couple rounds, you know, with the Solicitor General's office in that case. It was a lot of fun. I have to tell this story. Um, I got a call one day from the Solicitor General's office and they asked uh, for a 30-day extension to file their opposition in the Supreme Court to our petition. Now, I'm a person who's kind of known for procrastinating. And when I got a call from the Solicitor General's office asking for an extension, I enjoyed the moment. <laughs> I put the phone on hold. I said, just a moment. I'll need to confer. And I just waited. <laughs> and I said, OK, we'll give you the 30 days. <laughs> Every so often, you have those moments. Um, the court, you know, ultimately uh, dismissed um, our petition largely on jurisdictional grounds, although we had former uh, uh, authors of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, including former Vice President Walter Mondale, who wrote an amicus brief in support of us, saying that the court should hear the case. That was kind of cool. Um, but it evolved, and eventually you got the USA Freedom Act which ended the bulk collection of the domestic telephone record program in the United States. So it's actually a story uh, with a happy outcome. It was the first Snowden disclosure, and it's still more evidence that privacy and open government work together. We're not you know, like this. We're really much more on the same side. Long story, but I love that one. Hi. Uh, so in uh, Spain versus Google, uh, there was the split where uh, it was decided that Google had to remove information from the search index, but the newspaper could keep uh, the information up. I'm just trying to figure out what the court's rationale or what you think a sensible rationale would be to split those two. Right. Uh, I'm trying to figure out what the principles or considerations would be, because the thing is I can, I can imagine all kinds of ways in between where people are duplicating information online. So if, you have to, if Google has to remove information, would Twitter have to remove information if someone posted it there? 
or if someone put this on Wikipedia or some other large source, how, how do we determine which sources need to remove links and which do not? Yeah, those are good questions. I sense that you're heading to law school if you're not already in law school. Too out. Oh, see, I got that. Okay. <laughs> um, but you're right. I mean, you know, I, I presented the rule in a somewhat uh, simple way. It was, in fact, the way the court, the decision was announced. You had a search engine here and you had a news entity here. And talking about the importance of freedom of expression, I felt it was really important tonight to emphasize the distinction between the two. Now, you can imagine the lines blurring a bit. I mean, you, you, know, you could ask the question, well, what about the fact that the news organization makes the information available online and it wasn't available online 10 years ago? Does that somehow make more public a private fact than it otherwise should be? I'd probably be okay with that under my theory that under the architecture of the internet, I'd like to have the information available from the news organization because it would help news organizations. As to your specific question, you know, how do we delist on Twitter? Um, that's actually a good question for a former congressman from New York, I think. Um, I'm not sure, I'm not sure, you know, how you would do that type of, you know, uh, takedown uh, from Twitter. That's maybe a little bit more public. But in the, at least the simple architecture, you know, of HTTP, where we've got a, you know, a link to a web page, at least for the search company, I think we could draw a line there. So. Right, thank you so very, very much. Great, thank you again. <laughs> Choose it's recently limits the ability of employers to ask prospective employers